Pat Valley me tonight and I thank the, some of my friends from Port Stewart Baptist to come along to support me or maybe to hack me, as some of them are going to say. And you'll probably find that I'm not a preacher. Dar's a preacher. And I think it's for thinking back, it's about 25 years, I think, since I last shared my testimony in, uh, on a public platform. I think about the wee story I heard one time. The wee boy went to church with his dad for the first time and the preacher, he sat the hymn book down and the wee boy says, what's that, daddy? He says, well, it's for the, the preacher who's going to tell the hymn. Then he sat the Bible down. He says, what's that for? Oh, he says, he's, he's going to read from God's word. Then he took his notes out and he says, what's that for? Oh, he says, that's a, a sermon he's going to preach about. And then he took the watch off and he sat down. He says, daddy, what's that for? He says, that means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Well, my reading tonight is from Mark 10, chapter Mark 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark 10, 40, uh, 10, 46 to 52. And they came to Jericho, and she went out of Jericho with her disciples. A great number of people, blind Barnabas, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway, highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thy son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he showed his peace. But he cried the great more deal. Thy son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he cast away his garment, rose, and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt that I should do to him? What wilt that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. As Darrell says, and my name is Paul Thompson, I'm from a I'm a county man, I'm a man from Morningstown, although I relocated to, to Coleraine, a, a lovely part of your world up here. Uh, I was in Morningstown, Darrell come from Donningstown, which is about three miles away. I would have been from the, the better class of the side of town, the, the roughs come from Donningstown and the more refined people come from Morningstown. But we'll look tonight at Lion Barlet Mace. He was physically blind, couldn't see. When I look at my state, I was spiritually blind. I was born like that. Blind Barnabas, he was born blind. He was like this. And it reminds us in the Bible that we are born in sin. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, it says, But if the gospel be hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the mind of them which believe not, light the light of the glorious gospel, who is an image of God, should shine unto them. You know, sin can do can do terrible things. Blind Barnabas, his blindness reduced him to begging. And sin in your life can lead you to, to lead you to drugs, lead to alcohol, lead to gambling, can lead you down a, a, a terrible road. And if there's any young people in tonight you don't know Jesus as your saviour, I urge you at a young age, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The best thing you'll ever do because there's so much things you can get into your life as older as you get. Well, I'd like Blind Barnabas. I, I had heard about Jesus. Barn, Bar, blind Barnabas had heard about Jesus as well. I was brought up in a Christian home. Mum and dad both were Christians. I had two brothers and two sisters. And I hardly remember the time that they weren't saved. But I never put to trust Jesus in my, younger, in my younger days. I remember being sent along to the local Baptist church in Lurgan, Sunday morning, Sunday night. I went to a little gospel hall, Sunday school and Sunday afternoon. And I thank the Lord for those old uh, people from the Gospel Hall. They used to, they used to give you, they used to get you learn memory verses and pastors, or passages from the Scripture, and they give you money for it in those days. They do that now. No, they wouldn't do it up in here with Darrell. He wouldn't give you two D. But anyway, uh, used to get well, maybe it's something like that. But it used to be thrifty bits and uh, half crowns for learning your verses. No, I only learned the verses quite honest to get the money. It wasn't that I wanted knowing about the verses. But you know, the, the old men of God, they were planting the seed in my heart.
heart. They were putting the word of God into my heart. And little did I know, years, 29 years later, that I still remember them. Uh, I lived a very quiet life. I lived in the village. The Warringstown was a quiet place. I just lived outside it on the main road. So I didn't really know what it was to mingle with, with neighbours or children from, uh, from a state. And probably I lived a very quiet life. Probably next door neighbour kept horses and ponies. And that's why I spent most of my life riding horses and ponies up to about the age of 16. At 16... I started to work, it seems a long time away now. I started to work and, uh, and then 17, I got a job, I started to learn to drive. And that's when my life started to change, a wee bit of freedom. Going to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. Then I was 17, got the driving test. Still went to church on Sunday morning, still lived at home with mum and dad. And I would have went every Sunday morning just to, not to please, just out of respect. But after I got the car, I stopped drive, going to church on Sunday night. And it wasn't too long after that, I remember, one Friday night or Saturday night, out, my mates were all out in the cars and over in Banbridge. So I thought, what about if we go to Harry's bar or go to the coach? And I, perfectly honest, I had never been in a bar in my life. I'd never seen the inside of it. I didn't even know what they looked like. Of course, I just went along and mixed in with the crowd. And uh, started to work at 21. I started to work my own business. I had to start my own business. Things were going well. Uh, and even in the job I had, my own business, I used to get uh, the opportunity of traveling parts of the, over to Europe to different factories and going out with team of men and things I seen in the world, I don't believe they're even in Northern Ireland today, to my shame. And I started to slip more and more from God, no time for God, got involved, I used to race those hot rod uh, stock cars, done the hot rod racing, I went up around Akadu, Ballymena, Porta Down, that was my life. Then at 23, like we do all silly things in life, but at 23, I, I got married. And uh, once I got married, I stopped going to church completely. Up to that prior at home, I was at home till I got married, and I went on Sunday morning and Sunday night. I remember I used to come home at night time and early hours in the morning. And uh, I remember you'd get in the only in these houses, you go into the house and they waiting for doors. There's always one floorboard creaks. And that's the one you walk at two o'clock in the morning, you don't want your, your mum or dad here coming in. But I had to get down that fine art. I'd come in with a few, a few bottles in and get down the hall. No one miss it. And I, I remember going into the bedroom as well. I was probably in the bed and the next thing I heard my bedroom door open up and it was my mum. And she, and she knew I had been drinking. But then, thank you, thank, thank the Lord. They never really challenged me because I had respect and I was actually hiding it from them. And uh, I can remember as well, her coming in my room and I pretend I was sleeping, put my lips really, really close, my lips really tight, and tried to sleep, no breathing through my nose. And still tonight, I can hear my mum coming in, her face going down, and my face going, having a wee sniff to see what way I'd come in. But then my mum would have probably sat up to I come in, whatever, early hours in the morning. And thank the Lord that I was brought up in a church, and apparently there wasn't a prayer meeting. A prayer meeting Sunday morning and a prayer meeting Sunday night and a prayer meeting Thursday night and there wasn't a prayer meeting that my name, Paul Thompson, wasn't master, mentioned. Now if you're here tonight and you have a son or a daughter or maybe a, a mum or a dad or a brother or sister, they're not yet saved. Keep on praying. Keep on. Don't give up. Don't give up. I'm glad my parents didn't give up on me because I was, tw I was as sure as I was 29 before I become a Christian. And only the black sheep of the family, they kept on praying. And uh, like blind Barnabas, if you'd heard about Jesus, maybe not in a preaching way. I think of and uh, leading up to my conversion, it wasn't it wasn't the preaching. It wasn't going to hear people preaching. There was three other Christians. Um, like blind Barnabas, maybe you had to say the road, someone brought him a wee sandwich, some Christian brought him a wee sandwich or helped him to get across the street or brought him a jacket, or just showed kindness, showed what real Christianity is about. And I'm glad that I had a family and had friends who took an interest in me, although I had no interest in going to church. Uh, I used to say to some of the only time I went to church was on sad occasions, was weddings and funerals. But uh, I remember my brother-in-law and sister, uh, on a Friday night, they had all their friends come around and they'd pool table uh, and games room and I went down Friday night but these were all Christian people and they had a bit of fun and a bit of pool and 
The banter was great, the crack was good, but I knew they had something I didn't have. They had a peace, they were happy. And I could see joy. Sometimes in the world, the Christians give you the, the worst salespeople, the worst salespeople you've ever seen. We run around with big long faces. And you know, some, we've got, we've got, we have a peace. We don't, we don't even have a hope. We have an assurance. If Jesus come back tonight, we're, we're going to heaven. And we sit along, we're just smiling and let people see we've got a joy, we've got a peace, we've got a hope. And uh, I remember going to my sister's house and I would have come out many a night feeling empty. They had something I didn't have. I knew what they had, but I just couldn't pick it up. I remember another occasion, the church, they'd done a, an outreach, and uh, it wasn't a, a, a normal meeting. And I think, Darrell, you come along with something else years later, uh, where you, you, you come along, we had a meal prepared. Now, you could come to the meal yourself if you were a believer, but the, the criteria was that you bring a non-Christian with you. But I remember going along to the church. I know he invited me along, went along. And uh, next thing, long table. And it was Derek Blanchard from England was, was doing the epilogue. And there's no singing, there was nothing heavy about it. And here I sat down beside this wee man, wee man, wee godly man. He was a, uh, an elder in the church, Bob Nemes, he called me. And I said, oh, no, no, who the put me beside? He's going to preach to me all night. Bob, he sat beside me and he talked about business. He talked about my business and what he'd done. And he talked, he'd come down to my level. He's not a bad wee man. I just I sometimes expect people just going to hammer tongs, but we need to show the love. And uh, <laughs> I remember one other time uh, going to another church meeting, a men's meeting, and uh, I was under conviction at this stage, and the man preaching, and, I, and the place was full. There was about 300 people on it, and there was nobody else in it, but it seemed to be that God was just speaking to me. But my life changed about... 31 years ago, about March time, or started to change. I can remember I, in the business I would have had, well, in plumbers, merchant, bathrooms, plumbing, heating, stuff like that there. And this day, uh, my sister worked with me, and this day there was a man coming into the showroom to buy bathrooms. My sister went out to speak to him, and then I went out to do the, uh, help the customer. My sister says to me, do you know that man? I said, ah, yeah, that's Jackie Hughes. And Jackie Hughes is now, uh, is now a Baptist pastor, but he used to come to church when I was a wee, a wee lad, I was a lay reader, and I just knew him from the past. Talked about bathrooms, he went away. And I hadn't, I, now, I was 29, so I was my 23, I hadn't really gone to church for about the last six years. Just, just an odd guest service went along, or some type of outreach work. I used to go to the, the church, I was invited to the church barbecues, and I really enjoyed those, I wasn't a Christian, but again, I've seen Christians I seen a different light of Christian people. They had joy. They had could have a bit of fun. And I says, Christian life isn't dull at all. There's some there's some joy about it. And I used to go away from things like that, feeling an emptiness. But this man, Jackie Hughes, came into the showroom and he went away again. And obviously God was working on my life. I didn't know this, you know. Holy Spirit was beginning to work on my life. And the following maybe a week, two weeks later, I get the suit on, get the tie on, and I drive way down to Valley Keel Baptist. Jackie was a pastor in Valley Keel Baptist. That's somewhere between Dremore and Van Lynch and County Down. He just moved to Cook Baptist. I, I had no desire to go to church. I went along that night to Valley Keel Baptist. Nobody would have even known me. Slipped in. And Jackie was preaching on the Lord coming back. He talked about even back 31 years ago, or way back in Jerusalem, how they're building these apartments, how they're building these houses, all for the Jews coming back from the promised land, and that the Lord was on his way back. That really shook me in my boots. And I kept coming back Sunday night, Sunday night, and uh, I really wanted to give my life to Jesus, but I, I, didn't, I just couldn't have the courage. I just couldn't take the step. And then uh, it started not to go as much. Then it, there, Jackie and his wife, Ruth, was back in the showroom. I come back one day to pick bathroom assessors and things like that there and uh, again my sister was talking to them before I got out and my si they said to my sister she says uh, I see your fellas coming down this quite a bit and my sister says what? Paul going to church? He doesn't go to church and Jackie says oh I, says, I thought he was a Christian my life even you did, because I come from a Christian background and I was I was a right crap the show I was I was and honest <laughs> and people just assumed that I was a Christian and Jackie and then you can imagine now that my sister goes back to the church 
pause well now to church we don't know when the prayer if they prayed before me Monday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursday night. They must have been praying every day for me that uh, that happened. But it, on the 23rd of July, 1987, this is clear tonight, me, as t- clear tonight as was then, my life was a mess. I had everything, financial, having a lovely home, had two lovely girls, but things weren't right in the home. And I couldn't take it anymore. I was broken. And I remember that night, 23rd July 1987, I went out into the loose face of the garage. And Darl, you built the garage for me. It is still standing, although you did build it. But I went into the loose space of the garage. And I climbed up in the loose space of the garage. And I cut a rope, and there was a beam going across. And I tied a rope across the beam, and I tied it around my neck. And I wanted to end it all. I just, I, I just, it just was nothing for me. I had everything, but it was nothing. It was just an emptiness, and things weren't right in the home. I remember lying down on a mattress on the, in the roof space and there was, a, 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 there was the cot, of the children's cot, and I was sobbing and I was crying. And a voice seemed to come to me and says, Paul, what about the Lord Jesus? And I'm like, like bar, blind bar in the maze, the people were trying to hold him back. You can't, he cried out, the son of David, the son of David, have mercy on me. And he cried out, I'll keep quiet, keep quiet. The old devil come to me and says, Paul, he can't get saved. What's your mates going to think? What's your wife going to think? What about the nights you go out drinking? What about your, your party life? I think I said, well, I could cope. I, could cope. I, I wouldn't miss that. And then he just put a smack. He says, Paul, what about the Batman? What about the tax man? Now, if you're a bat inspector, tax man, don't worry about it. all sorted out from 30 years ago. But that was a big thing to me. I was, if you want a better word, I was clean the Batman. And I was clean the tax man. I wasn't doing it straight. I was two sets of books. And that was a big, big thing for me. And just prior to that all happened, I was trying to tidy my life up. I'd been under conviction. And I remember going to hot working at the hot rods and the guys would help me and the language wasn't so good. And I says, Boy, stop, stop using that. That's terrible language. He says, Thompson, are you getting good living? I remember going over to the World Championship in Ipswich just a few weeks, a couple weeks prior to that. And the whole weekend I didn't have a drink. I went to the race and enjoyed the race. Didn't really enjoy the race. I just had an emptiness. But that night I lay in the race space and thinking about anything at all. And uh, these sort of things that were in my mind, well, the two wee girls, I never went to church. They didn't know about Jesus. And they used to, used to hound me, Paul, you aren't, you aren't even showing your children away. You're taking your children to hell. I used to have this thing in my mind, come to the judgment, and my children stand there and says, Dad, you never told us. You never brought us to church. And this was really speaking to me. But I finally, I remember Jackie Hughes, when he preached, he used to say that he was available 24-7. He could lift the phone, talk to him any time. And finally, he came down into the roof space. And I remember this was about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I go into the house, and those days that, you had a dial rack and inquiries to get the telephone number. Sorry. Okay. He's still looking after me. Uh, and I went into the house and I rang Drax and Cries and got uh, Jackie, Pastor Jackie's number. And he had just had moved from Coke Baptist to Valley Key and started dialing the number and then started ringing, hung up. And the old devil says, Paul, you can't. He can't ring anybody at this time of night. But I finally picked up courage again. And Jackie answered the phone. Hello? And he was sleeping at that stage. Hello? And he says, Paul Thompson. He says, who? And he says, Paul Thompson, the, the bathroom man. Paul, what, what, what can I do for you? What's wrong? And he says, Jack, I need to talk to you. And uh, he says, do you want me to come and see you? I said, no, don't drive. He says, do you want to come and see me? I said, I'd love to go and talk to you. He says, do you want to come now? I says, if you don't mind, I'll go now. And I remember driving. It was a good half an hour away. Well, it felt like half an hour. And I remember going into Jackie's house that night. And by that stage, his wife Ruth was up with him. And they met me coming into the house, sat down, and were talking to me. And the old-fashioned gospel preacher, he knew that I was under conviction. He knew that the Lord was speaking to me. 
And he started to quote me scripture. And he says, I, I know all that. Because quote me scripture I learned in Sunday school days 25 years ago. I knew all this. And I, I just couldn't grasp salvation. It, I, I, was, I was brought up in a real uh, evangelical church. And I, I could have preached the gospel. I could have told you how to get saved. But I could not grasp the simplicity of it. And I remember that night, Jackie, just in the early hours morning, just handed me the Bible. He says, Paul, if I was to give you that Bible, what would you do? He says, I would take it. And see, like, it was just like a flash. It was like a gift of God. It was a gift. Salvation is a gift. And I remember just, I don't even want to pray or what I said. But I know that night I just prayed and I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sin and come into my life and just help me to sort things out. And there was no flashing lights. There was nothing. But I, I did get that inner peace. And... Uh, then I, I had a cup of tea and we're talking and I says, uh, can I use your phone? And I rang my father. Can you imagine ringing your dad at, I think what time, four o'clock in the morning? Dad answers the phone, hello. And then he goes, hello. He was sleeping, he was half sleeping. Is Paul here? And my papa says, what's he done again? But he says, dad, I'd just like to tell you that I just have asked Jesus into my heart. I know what, I can nearly hear the tears hitting the phone that night. He prayed for years, I'm sure he'd give up. Don't give up, don't give up on your loved ones. Pray for them every day, and I thank God. And uh, I remember we headed down home, and I can't remember if I even ever told my wife or what happened, but anyway, the next morning, I went into work, and I was thinking, uh, at that time, I'd, I'd maybe employed about eight people, and. There was an old man called Billy Patterson, great old soul. Billy worked with me till he was 86. He worked three days a week. And he's one of these men that he, didn't, he wouldn't have preached it. Boy, he lived it. He used to have a saying, he says, the best tes testimony is in shoe leather. And boy, he lived it. And I remember meeting Billy that morning, coming down the path up to the trade counter. And he says, Billy, I have something to tell you. You know, Billy's in the glory of 20 years or more. And... Uh, I can see the big smile and give him a big hug. He says, the best thing you've done. Praying for you for years. You know, that doesn't just didn't stop there. And I did get involved and uh, I started to go to church. My two wee girls started to come to church. They started to go to the community club. And one of the amazing things that a few months later, my oldest daughter, we were going through our good news correspondence sheets. And uh, I said, I'm starting to ask these questions and these things. One of the questions was, have you asked Jesus into your heart? I says, Daddy, I have. And I, I, she tell me all about it. And she started, Daddy, Daddy, I have. But she, as if I, I didn't believe her. She says, well, tell me all about it. I says, Daddy, the other night when, uh, I don't want to name, use her names, the one that probably might listen to this on CD, I don't want to embarrass them with their names. She says, when her wee sister went to sleep, she says, Daddy, I got out of bed. And I got down my knees and I asked Jesus into my heart. Chantelle, I said, why did you do that? She says, Daddy, I want to go to heaven with you. There's a wee girl at six years of age who could see what Jesus had done in her daddy's life, how he had changed his life. And I got involved in church life when, when the, when the church I was in, in youth work. I was a deacon in the church. I got involved with this man. I remember the short, I'll never forget the day Darrell Lurgan Park. Darrell was only saved about a week maybe two weeks at the most. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't have any many people, the Christian friends around you. And I remember him lifting the phone. He says, do you fancy going to, to, to Lurgan Park to the rally? And that time I was, hadn't been too well. And I didn't know what I had then when I was suffering from pericarditis, which is like a, a virus attacks the muscle around the heart. And I had the energy hardly to walk up in that pulpit. But Darrell was just saved. I said, I can't let that this man down. I'll not forget, it was the longest day of my life. I must have been in that park for about five hours. And, uh, but just wanted to encourage him. And, and then after that, Darrell, he got saved. He got a real burden, burden for Donaldstown people. And every Sunday night after church service, we would have had a helped Darl to run a, a meeting, or once a month in Downtown's Our Hall, and then went down to Mara Lynn Hall. We had great times in those days, and God used me. But I could just stop now and say, wasn't that great? Wasn't that a, a lovely testimony? But I can't stop there, uh, because things have happened since that there. I went on, and 20 years ago, my life 
changed quite a bit. You know, when we believe in prayer, but sometimes when we pray, and you really honestly pray, God can answer those prayers, but not answer them the way you expect. And I had everything 20 years ago. A lovely house, big house, indoor swimming pool, BMW, Mercedes sitting at the door, six-figure six salary, everything going well for me. I, I couldn't want any more. But my marriage was in a mess. My wife was an alcoholic, and I just, I was my wit's end. I didn't want to do. I was a deacon in the church, I was doing all the right things, and the poor children. And I remember one night in Marlin Mission Hall, Daryl was very much involved, and I had went along to the prayer meetings there some of the Friday nights. On a, a, the hall's still there, but it's not as a, a, a mission hall anymore. And I get bring you to a spot that night where I prayed for the city. He says, Lord, just sort my marriage out. Sort my life out. I can't, I can't go on with this. And boy, the, the Lord, and he, he listened to my prayers. And uh, he stripped me of everything. And I probably, a lot of three, the three bad choices I'd made as well. I lost my home. I lost everything, lost my job lost everything, I had nothing. And uh, my wife walked off and left me with the poor children. Thank you, thank you God for that, I was able to put them back. And I was just broken, but thank God I could turn to him. And after that I got involved in a, another wee church in Lurgan, a small church called Emmanuel Church. And I, thought there was I didn't leave the church I was in, it wasn't, they were a lovely church, but quite honestly, they, they didn't know how to cope with Someone from a broken marriage. Didn't I heard a couple of someone going through a divorce? And, uh, and th 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 those two, tw 20 years ago, it was hard for people. I was trying to find a small church who could love and care for me and help me through it. And God did help me through it. And I could tell you stories of uh, Harry Blast, times there wasn't even hardly enough money on the table to put food on the table, and how the, the, the Lord just sent people. And those were difficult times. But I thank God for it. It made me a, a better person. It made me depend on God. I was maybe, when I had my own business, I really didn't need, I, I really wasn't dependent, but I had everything. And God had to show me that, strip me with everything, that he is there, he's the only one. And uh, that was great and went on. And then, 11 years ago, it doesn't get easier, this testimony, because I did walk away from God. I did not have a relationship. But 11 years ago, I was involved in another relationship and it was, a, it was a Christian relationship and I got really really hurt there and I wouldn't ask people to put their hands up tonight because they might be too many hands up for many of you to hurt by Christians and I wasn't hurt by the church, nothing to do with the church but I stopped going to the church I was just so hurt and that was stupid because I still turned to God but I let the hurt go inwardly and I stopped and drift away from the church and stopped praying and went nowhere and uh, well it went on for uh, quite a few years and even through those times uh, I, I wasn't working I, I worked with that uh, before that I worked with that Emmanuel church and I was uh, I was project manager with them they actually started a church with about 60 people and now there's about 700 at it God has really blessed them and used them and God can bless and you use and go rain there's a big estate behind us there and I know you have a mission come up, just pray that God will bring the people. They might bring people through your door. You mightn't like the look of them, but God can save them. God can use them. And uh, now I can't even lost my mother. I have no tune. I wasn't even looking at them. <laughs> so I had slipped away. And then about uh, 11 years ago, I was in another relationship with a non-Christian. Lovely girl. Loved her with all my heart with her four years and then that door closed and that was hard but I had God with me and uh, I'm going to share something tonight and I don't know why I'm sharing this no one knows this but 11 years ago as, uh, I know it was but this all happened about three years ago or it all happened and I hadn't been going to church for about seven years prior to that maybe longer and I was broken and God had blessed me even through walking away from him. He had brought me back into the business world, got me a, a fantastic job, good salary, loved it. Uh, but I still did not walk with him. 
I turned and walked away from him. And then this relationship ended and I was broken. I lost two and a half stone inside about inside three months. Just the, the depression, the stress that set in. But I walked away from God. I, hadn't, I wasn't turned to him anymore. And uh, going back three years ago, I took an overdose and had it pumped out. That was hard. I've never shared that with anybody before. And there, we were involved, I'm sure, digging the church years before that. But if you're here tonight and you're not walking with God, you've walked away from God, are you? Or you're in that early stage of just getting turned back to Him. See, when it comes to the hard times, He's there for you, help you through. But anyway, I started to. I've been coming up to the North Coast for about the last seven years and uh, still want to stay up around here and I bought another wee house. And uh, I remember I started to slip into Port Stewart Baptist in the odd time. And uh, I remember one Sunday morning there was a guy called Chris Fairfield. He came over and sat beside me and I didn't share, I wasn't going, didn't share this with anyone and where, where I was and, and he just said, I'd just like to pray with you. I remember Chris praying with me and he showed me, he showed me love and he just cared for me. And then I, I just kept coming back week after week and I just slipped. What I said if I ever got back, went, ever went back to church again, I'd never ever get involved and never say never, never, never. Well, I've heard somebody else saying that. But anyway, I said I'd never get involved again. But thank God I am involved again now. But I remember one Sunday morning and it was uh, Norman Linus, is probably well known in this area to you. I didn't know who Norman was. Norman was sitting beside me. We're talking. He says, Paul, I'd like to pray with you. But he says, Paul, I do feel there's something in your life you need to deal with. Boy, is it dear. Was he on the button? And there was something I had to deal with. And it took me six months to deal with it. But see, when I dealt with it, I was allowing God to come back into my life. And I thank the Lord that he's restored me. He's helped me through the the hard times. And maybe you're here tonight and you're going through hard times. I don't know. I don't even know why I share that story. I was not intended to ever share that with anyone. But maybe there's someone here tonight and you're going through. Even as a Christian, and it's just you're hitting a brick wall. Just turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus through the hard times. Just in the last few weeks, uh, I was thinking going back to Blind Barnabas. Uh, he heard about Jesus. You know, some, I like that wee bit. And he cried out to Jesus. I cried out to Jesus. But know the wee bit I like. I like about he had the jacket on, the old coat on, and he threw it off. There's nothing going to trip him up going to Jesus. Are you here tonight? Do you want to throw that jacket off? Do you want to throw that jacket off and give your life to Jesus? Come uh, confess your sin. And uh, I can remember there, but only a few months ago, my wee six year old granddaughter, she said to me, Granda Paul, when did you lose your sin? Imagine a wee girl at six asked her, when did you lose your sin? And I says, uh, Grace, I says, Granda Paul was silly. He waited till he was 29 before he lost his sin. There's a wee girl at six. Well, remember you're here tonight, and I was with a man a few weeks ago, 75 years of age, dying with cancer. I'd never met him before. And he was telling me that, I said, have you thought about the Lord Jesus? Have you thought about Dan? And he went back. He said, well, I was brought up in a church and Sunday school. And I says, do you know where you've been? He says, you probably were sick. And he says, I was. He says, I started to think about the Lord. And he says, he couldn't grasp it. And there I was able to tell him, there I was 29 years of age. I couldn't grasp it. Him at 75 couldn't grasp it. Yet my daughter at six and my little granddaughter at six could grasp her simple salvation was. Now, when I look back, that... Uh, I, I threw the old coat away. Barnabas threw the coat away when he come to Jesus. And whenever you think about it, I don't want to be irreverent about this, but Jesus asked the Barnabas, what's wrong with you? What do you want? Like blind Barnabas was blind, but Jesus wanted blind Barnabas just to confess, I'm, I'm, I'm blind, I need to get my sight back. Maybe Jesus here, or you're here tonight and you've never put your trust in the Lord Jesus. Jesus wants you to come tonight and say, I'm just sorry for sin. Please come into my life, Lord, and just save me. I remember you were here tonight and you like me. You threw that cloak off years ago, but you like me, you went and put that old cloak back on again. You allowed sin back in your life. Maybe God's here tonight. 
and he's speaking to you that you've walked away, you're struggling, you're a backslider, God can restore you. And I, I can, it's nearly harder to come back to God as a backslider than it is. It's easier near to get saved. And though I've just found God's help more so in the, the last few weeks, in the last 10 weeks I've had three friends who have died. I had a, a friend of mine 10 weeks ago today. Unfortunately, he didn't leave a testimony behind. And uh, he was on his way up the north coast, or up the Antrim coast on a motorbike. On the night before, he went with a couple of his friends and says, well, we're going up around the, up around the Larne coast and said, well, up in Port Trish. We'll give PT a ring, that's me, and we'll take him out for a wee ice cream and cheer him up a bit. He's a lovely friend of mine. And, uh, but he never made it. Five past 11, 10 weeks ago, it ended. You know, when you listen, you see the blind bar about his story tonight, it was the last time Jesus was passing through Jericho. He wasn't coming that way again. This was the only last, maybe the first time, and the last opportunity blind Barnabas was going to have a chance of getting his sight back. And he wasn't going to miss it. Just two weeks ago, uh, my mother passed away. Praise God. I was just telling. It wasn't easy. She was 90 years of age, but it was... Although she had been ill for 12 years, she was still sudden. But God, through people praying for me, I have to admit that week my mom passed away. I don't think I opened my Bible or prayed the week. I just couldn't. But there's some people. Uh, the, the church I go to, there's a lot of praying people. They prayed for it. And I sensed God's presence. You know, it's great to have Jesus back in your life. And then I remember even two weeks ago, we were all planning. My mom, if she'd lived for another 50 days, my dad and her would have been 70 years married. And we were planning what we'd do for a wee anniversary for my dad and my mum. She never made the 70 years. Jesus, could be your last chance tonight? This could be the last time Jesus will speak to you. Could be your last chance as a backslider. We just don't know what's happened there. Our pastor, Pastor John, took ill in February. Take it home yesterday. Big surprise. Come to Jesus tonight. And I had the wee church I go to, Something that always puzzles me. There's two crosses in it. And I said, why is there two crosses? Why is there not three? And uh, I've often thought about this. You know, I think about Jesus. He died for us. Jesus went down to this wicked and sinful world. Lived like the way we live. Knew what it was to feel pain. He knew what he went to. He went to Calvary. It says in the Bible, no man suffered like this man. Also, his visage was so marred. Jesus, when he went to, the, went, went to the, laying that day in the garden of Selma, he cried out, Father, it's not thy will, but thine be done. Take this cup from me. He was lying prostrate on the ground. And they took Jesus and uh, whipped his back. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. And they nailed him upon a cross for our sin. No man suffered like this man. But praise God, he's no longer on the cross. Now you think of those two crosses in the church. It reminds me of, of the, the, the two thieves on the cross. There's two thieves at the cross. And people will turn around and say, oh, I've left it too late. It's never too late. You think there's a thief that's on the cross. They, need, they deserve to be there. They deserve the punishment they were getting. And one cried out, the Lord save me. And Jesus says, today you're in paradise with me. It's never, ever too late. Young or old, please Put your trust in Jesus Christ. And thank God that he's no longer upon the cross. He's no longer, he's risen. Because if Jesus wasn't risen tonight, it's pointless me even here. But just, I'd just like to thank you. Just remember another wee story. I'm going to finish now. Uh, I, something I don't wear since recently. Was the, two, the two donkeys were having a conversation in Jerusalem. And one donkey said to other, says, last week I came through here and they were throwing their... their, their coach down the ground or throwing palm trees for me to walk on. I says this week, still want to know me. And all the donkey says to him, no, not. Without Jesus, you have nothing. You know, if you don't have Jesus in your life tonight, you have nothing. And I just pray and trust if there's someone here tonight that don't know Jesus, that they will put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, brother.